Well, welcome to chapter nine, the history in our genes. Uh, this chapter focuses on molecular phylogenetics and understanding uh, how genes evolve so that when we use genes in phylogenetic analyses, we understand the nature of the data and how we can use those genes to look at the history of anything from, well, genes themselves to the history of populations, uh, species, and higher groups, higher taxonomic groups. So the chapter opens with this story about Sarah Tishkoff, who has spent many years, uh, first as a graduate student, now as a professor, collecting DNA samples from people throughout Africa. And uh, at this point, she's collected thousands of samples. So uh, by looking at the DNA of uh, many thousands of individuals, uh, she's able to identify alleles that make some individuals more vulnerable to diseases. And uh, she's able to create a, G a detailed genealogy of humans, uh, looking at the history of our own species within our species. So uh, while this is used as the introductory story, uh, showing us that uh, we can understand our own human history through investigations of our genes, uh, the broader point is made that molecular phylogenetics can be used to understand evolution within any of life's lineages, whether it be prokaryotic, plant, animal, fungi, protist, whatever. So let's take a look at what we can learn from the history in our genes. So just like species uh, have their own genealogies, they fit into a phylogenetic tree with other species and we can trace their evolutionary history and figure out the genealogies of individual species. We can figure out the genealogies of individuals. Um, imagine your own self being part of a family genealogy uh, that you share with your potentially siblings, definitely your parents, uh, cousins, aunts, uncles on back. Uh, but genetic loci also have their own genealogies, their own evolutionary histories. So let's take, for example, this figure that's uh, from your book, and we're looking at this allele G. So this allele that has a nucleotide guanine or G at a particular site, and that allele G is being passed on generation after generation. We can sort of see its history unfolding there in a cladogram-like diagram. But at some point, you can see on one of those lineages for allele G, there's a mutation. And that guanine at that particular site gets converted into a thymine. Well, now that allele that has a thymine instead of a guanine is being passed on through its own successive generations. And now it has its own history. So we would say, just like we talk about bones being homologous. So this bone is homologous to that bone. Um, it's just been modified through history. Uh, we can talk about these alleles being homologous because they reflect the same position in the genome. They're on the same position of a chromosome. It's just that this allele has experienced a mutation and has gone from G to T. So when this happens, of course, in a population, there's consistently mutations, random mutations going on, and these mutated versions of alleles get passed on. Now uh, the population is polymorphic. As soon as an allele experiences a mutation and has a different form, the population is uh, now polymorphic for that particular locus. So in this case, it's polymorphic for G and T. So we can figure out molecular phylogenies, and we're going to expand on that in the upcoming slides and the uh, rest of the chapter. But a key thing to get into your heads right now and for me to pass on to you is while we use different genes to estimate 
uh, the evolutionary history of species, species phylogenies. It's really important to understand that molecular phylogenies, the evolutionary history of genes, does not always match up to the evolutionary history of species. Um, there are lineages of alleles within a gene, and we can trace those just like in this diagram. We're looking at uh, this lineage of this allele going from G to T, but there's also lineages of organisms within species. There's different kinds of lineages. These alleles, remember, exist within populations, and uh, they each have their own independent history. We can trace and track the history of each one of the alleles in a population. That's a huge endeavor, of course. And once an allele transitions and mutates, and we now have a new form, like in this case, both the G form and the T form, you still have that ancestral form sticking around. It doesn't go away just because there's a mutation. So now within this one population, you have the ancestral alleles, like the G version here, and it's persisting along with the more derived version, the T version here. Um, so there's a lot of consistent patterns between envisioning and thinking about lineages of alleles and lineages of species, but there are some fundamental differences, as I said, we'll expand on. So here, this uh, slide is uh, focusing on the concept of coalescence and what it means when two alleles coalesce. So fundamentally, what it means, two alleles uh, coalesce at the point that those two alleles came from a common ancestral allele. Uh, so that is the phenomenon of coalescence. And we can trace alleles back in time, we can trace alleles back in history, and we can find the point at which two alleles came from a common ancestral allele. And the amount of time uh, that has elapsed or taken place since an ancestral allele has given rise to two different alleles is literally called the coalescence time. And we can determine that. Now, coalescence time, uh, let's look at this figure, uh, figure A. So this is uh, illustrating this point. So we've got uh, 10 organisms that are arrayed vertically, those 10 circles going from top to bottom. And we're tracing an allele, say on the far left-hand side of figure A, and it's uh, depicted in the second from the top organism, and it's colored black. So now we can trace that allele forward in time, and we can see how that allele has been passed on to uh, a couple organisms, but the one we're focusing on is the black one. So we're tracing that black version. So we go one generation forward, it's been passed forward to that organism. Now that organism is passing that black allele on to two organisms in the next generation. So you can see them going forward. And then from there, they're passing on to the next generation. So eventually you can see one of those black alleles experiences a mutation from one generation to the next and it's being color coded red. So now we have a new version of that allele, and uh, now we're tracing it forward in time. And we can see when we get to the far right-hand side of that figure, we're now tracked two organisms on the far right that have that red allele. And uh, if we, we, how far back do we have to go to trace where those two organisms with the red allele came from the common ancestral allele where there was a mutation? And per that figure, you can see two generations back. How many generations back would we have to go to see where that allele came from the black allele? Well, that would be three generations back. Okay, so you can also see on the far right-hand side of figure A, there is a allele, uh, allele depicted in black, an organism uh, that has that black allele. And we have to go back one, two, three, four, five, six, seven generations all the way, actually six generations on, to the left, 
to see where that black allele is coalescing with the ones that turned red. I don't mean to make this all sound complicated, of course, but uh, to just trying to explain what this figure is showing uh, in terms of what coalescence means and what coalescence time means. Now, there's a couple components that affect coalescence time. One of them is whether natural selection is strong on a particular allele or whether it's weak. Uh, relatively strong selection can shorten coalescence times, make it go to fixation quickly such that uh, every individual in a population has that particular allele. If selection is strong, that can happen quickly and you have a short coalescence time. How do we estimate coalescence time? Well, just verbally here, without showing you the mechanics, the mathematics, uh, it's determined by under, uh, considering population size and allele frequencies. Both of those co components figure into estimating coalescence time. So for example, with population size, if a population is huge, then the time, the coalescence time to go back to where two alleles came from a common ancestral allele could be really long, a long period of time. But if a population is relatively small, then uh, hypothetically we would not have to go back as far, fewer organisms in the population, to find where those two alleles coalesce. And then the final consideration on, on here is that with so many genes and in, in a population uh, and so many different versions of genes, so many different alleles in a population, the number of gene histories is huge. It's astronomical. Uh, so we're really considering kind of a mind-boggling topic here in terms of the history of genes and the history of alleles. So understand the general concept, uh, but um, it uh, can be pretty complicated and complex. So to expand on this idea that I ended with on the last slide, that with so many genes and so many alleles existing in a population, there are an astronomical number of different allele and gene histories. So uh, here we have an example from humans uh, looking at a sample of different human genes. Uh, they're arrayed in the figure from the top down from Y chromosome DNA on the top to mitochondrial DNA uh, below that, and then a bunch of um, autosomal genes uh, arrayed below the MT DNA. And these different human genes have different coalescence histories. Uh, this is taken from a paper published in. 2008, Templeton and Wakeley. And the mathematics behind this and calculating this is, is pretty crazy. I would not be one to consult about the mathematics, but there are strong uh, statistical techniques uh, based on our understanding of genes and population biology to estimate these coalescence times. So you can see from the figure that the coalescence of uh, human mitochondrial DNA, for example, is doesn't we don't have to go very far back in time. Uh, in fact, there's a range given here between 152,000 to 473,000 years. Um, whereas um, Y DNA, DNA on the Y chromosome is pretty comparable. Looks like uh, coalescence time might be slightly less. Uh, but some genes, as you can see uh, from the figure, coalesce even long before our species existed. So Homo sapiens has been around for maybe around 300,000 years. And you can see the time scale on the top is in millions of years, going up to almost 9 million years. So there are several autosomal genes depicted here. You would have to go back uh, a million, two million, 
uh, or more years to find the point at which alleles coalesce for these particular genes uh, to a common ancestral allele. Uh, we're not talking about ancestral organism, we're talking about ancestral alleles. So there's a wide range of coalescence times existing in uh, organisms of a population in terms of their histories and how far you have to go back to find ancestral, where, where alleles uh, share common ancestral alleles. So, you know, as, as you know already, uh, populations can diverge or split into independently evolving populations, which using a lineage concept of species, those would be new species having independently evolving lineages. And that can take thousands to millions of years. It's variable. Uh, the rate of speciation is all over the place in nature. Um, it may take thousands to millions of years for independently evolving populations to become reproductively isolated so that their individual organisms can't mate anymore. Um, meanwhile, genes within these species are forming their own evolutionary histories, their own lineages, and we call those histories gene trees. And so each gene has its own gene tree, its own history within a population. Over long periods of time, uh, species may acquire fixed alleles at various loci, such that a locus uh, only has one allele it's at a hundred percent frequency. That can happen due to genetic drift or selection, and or selection. Uh, and these fixed alleles can help us distinguish species. So we say, oh, look, species number one has allele A for this gene, and species two has allele B for this gene, and species three has allele C. So if we can find fixed differences, then the species can become distinguishable based on that. Um, if species uh, have relatively long times between their speciation events, between the times that the populations are splitting and diverging and turning into new species, uh, then the gene trees might match up or have a very good chance of matching up with the species trees. And we can use the gene trees and to estimate uh, accurately what the species trees are. But if species diverge rapidly, if lineages are splitting pretty quickly, then uh, incomplete lineage sorting might happen. And incomplete lineage sorting occurs when gene trees do not match species trees. And the figure that's presented here on the slide is showing you how this can happen. So if we look at figure A, uh, we see three species, one, two, and three, and the amount of time in between the speciation events is relatively long. You can tell that on the figure because the branch lengths are pretty long. So that is the species history shown there. Species one and two are sister taxa, and then together they share a, a recent ancestor with species three. Um, and the time in between these speciation events is relatively long. So the genes uh, within these species also have their own histories, and we're looking at one gene in this diagram and it's got three different alleles that are color-coded, blue, green, and kind of purple. And in the case of figure A, where there's relatively long periods of time in between the speciation events, it gives ample time for lineage sorting, for complete lineage sorting of this gene. So we can trace uh, the purple allele back in species A, it's become fixed in species A, and trace the green allele back in species 2, it's been fixed in species 2. 
And uh, at some point, um, when species one and two had a common ancestor, we can see that those two alleles coalesce. And so the gene history is showing the same pattern as the species history. If we were to use this gene to uh, try to hypothesize the species relationships, it would work. The gene history is matching the species history. If we go back further in time, we can see in species three, there's another allele that's depicted in blue and it's fixed in this population and uh, it co eventually coalesces with the uh, ancestral purple allele way back in the beginning. So in figure A, the gene tree is matching the species tree. Now look at figure B. Figure B is showing much more rapid uh, speciation. Uh, the, the length of the branches of the species tree is much, much shorter. So species one and two share a common ancestor not very far back in time. Uh, but um, there's been incomplete lineage sorting with this rapid speciation time. So if you track the green allele in species two, in this case, and track it backwards, it actually is most closely related to the blue allele, which is in species three. Uh, so while species two is most closely related to species one, that's, we, that, that's true. Um, in fact, the green allele that's in species two is more closely related to the blue allele in species three. So if we use this gene to try to figure out the species history, it wouldn't work. We would conclude that species two is more closely related to species three when in fact it's not. And this error would be made, this mistake would be made because of incomplete lineage sorting. So this is an important concept to understand that when we use gene trees to estimate species trees, there is the potential that we could make a mistake. So here we can uh, show you an example of how incomplete lineage sorting gives rise to inaccurate species trees. There's a mismatch. And we can look no farther, though you don't have to look any farther than uh, our own evolutionary history with chimps and gorillas and orangutans. So for many years, anatomists have presented the hypothesis that humans and chimps are each other's closest relatives based on our shared derived characteristics with chimpanzees. And then gorillas are the next closest relative outside of that, and then orangutans. And that species relationship is shown in uh, the figure on the right side of your slide. When biologists started sequencing genes uh, in these different species and using them to estimate how the species are related, they were coming up with different results. One group of researchers maybe sequenced a handful of genes and found, oh yeah, humans and chimps are sister taxa, just like the anatomists have been telling us. Then another research team sequences some other genes and finds, no, we found that chimps and gorillas are each other's closest relatives. It's a different result. It's like, well, what's going on? What was going on is that there was incomplete lineage sorting with uh, several of these genes. The branch lengths between our speciation events was short enough that incomplete lineage sorting has become a problem as discussed in the last slide. So a solution to this, and this doesn't just apply to this problem of humans and chimps and gorillas, but it applies to any um, study um, that's trying to uh, explain the relationships of different species using genetic molecular data. A solution is to analyze many gene trees not just a couple or a handful, but as many as possible, and or even better, entire genomes.
And by doing that, the overall weight of evidence from the totality of all the gene trees should steer us closer, as close as we can hope, to the true species phylogenies. So when this was done with humans and chimps and gorillas and orangutans, uh, it was found that overall 70% of the gene trees suggest a human-chimp relationship consistent with the anatomy. 30% suggest a chimp-gorilla relationship, a minority. So by looking at the entire genomes, we're able to zero in on a clearer picture. Uh, yes, yeah, so if you look at figure B, you can see how you know one particular gene tree uh, would uh, actually show that chimps and gorillas are each other's closest relatives because of how those um, alleles coalesce. So, but again, by looking at whole genomes or many genes, then the overall patterns of how species are related uh, become better focused.